Hello and welcome to the first of what I hope will be a few videos covering some of the science of Elite Dangerous, or in the very least, physics and astronomy. So, to start us off, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the most common sights that people will see navigating around the Milky Way. That's stars. They are sort of all over the place, and you can't move more than a few light years without bumping into one. And with that in mind, you might be asking a few questions. Why are all the stars around here red? Where are all the huge stars? And where are all the white stars? And what's perhaps the meaning of life? While I can't really answer the last question, it is my aim to cover the rest. So, let's make your brain hurt a little, but ultimately, you should come away knowing a little bit more about the universe out there from our observations and how that has been used to shape the world of elite dangerous. So let's go back to basics and ask, what is a star? This seems like a simple question, but don't click away just yet. They basically form from large clouds of interstellar gas, which is mostly hydrogen, and which collapses in on itself due to gravity. If the mass of the resulting ball is large enough, the process of it gravitationally collapsing will cause enough heat production to initiate hydrogen fusion in the core. The star then enters a state called hydrostatic equilibrium. This is basically a fancy term which means that the gravitational compressive pressure is in equilibrium with the thermal pressure from the heat of the core. So, as long as the star produces heat through fusion, it will remain stable. Next, we ask ourselves, what determines the colour of a star? Well, a star can be modelled as a black body radiator, and such, the colour spectrum of the photosphere, or the visible disk of a star, is directly related to its temperature. When we look at a star using a telescope, we can, easily, inverted commas, determine three things. The colour spectrum, the brightness, and, with a few other measurements, the distance. Using this data, we can thus calculate the total energy output of a star, or its luminosity. And now, for a plot. What you see here is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of luminosity against BV color index. Great, I hear you say, but what does it really mean, and why does it matter? Well, what it shows us is how we can logically compare the physical sizes of different stars, and how we characterize them. This is our sun, or Sol. Let us add our neighbors. Alpha 1, 2, and Proxima Centauri. With logical reasoning, we can say the following. Stars of the same temperature, that have drastically larger luminosity, must thus have a larger radius. For a star to be hotter, or cooler, it means they must have higher or lower mass, respectively. So, it is a pretty good guess that Alpha Centauri 1 is probably slightly higher mass than our Sun, and Alpha Centauri 2 is cooler, smaller, and thus lower mass than our Sun. And as regard to Proxima, it is obviously a tiny, tiny, low mass cool star. So, why do I say this? Well, it's all from this equation. The Stefan Boltzmann equation relates the total photon power output from a black body as a function of temperature and area. We can measure this on Earth and know that it works reasonably well. For a star, assuming they are approximately spherical, we can calculate the surface area 4 pi r squared. I also just told you that we can measure the temperature based upon the colour of the star, and so if we know a star's luminosity based upon how bright it appears compared to standard candles and known distances, we can thus figure out the total radius. Now, let's go back to our Hertzsprung Russell diagram and add points to represent stars in the Hipparchos catalogue, Yale Bright Star catalogue, and Gliese catalogues for the nearest 150 light years. You will see a diagonal line forming from low luminosity red stars to high luminosity blue stars. This is known as the main sequence, and it represents the normal or stable configuration of the star. Our Sun is a main sequence star, and thanks to popular science, it is often incorrectly referred to as insignificant or completely normal. It isn't really the case, as in our locality, the Sun is hotter, brighter, and larger than about 80% of all the stars. I'd certainly not call the top 20% as being completely normal. Two other populations will catch your eyes. They are above and below the main sequence. And I said that for a star to be significantly brighter or dimmer, to have the same color temperature, must therefore be larger or smaller in radius. You can guess then that the population above the main sequence is the so-called giant branch, and the stars below are dwarfs, white dwarfs to be specific. The color temperature of stars also relates to their classification as presented here the famous Oh Be A Fine Girl, Guy, Kiss Me. 
The knee shape at the M class is supposed to be related to photosphere instability from a high amount of flares or sudden brightness outburst observed in this class of stars. It means they probably don't quite follow the same black body relation and that B minus V is an inadequate measure, as the wavelength of, of an M class star shows us very sudden fall off in the blue spectrum, more than perhaps expected from a black body. How does this relate to Elite Dangerous? Well, it took me a long time to get here, but here's what I can show you. It is a Hertzsprung Russell diagram as extracted from EDDB.io. You can see some obvious differences, but don't scream, This is terrible, just yet. The database does not contain raw luminosity information and only the temperature and radius. As luminosity is related to these two parameters, we expect the stars to follow a reciprocal curve function, since that is how we convert between temperature and B minus V. It is sort of a cheat and might not be correct. It is interesting to see that the distribution fits right over the main sequence of the HYG catalog and mostly diverges at the M class D as demonstrated here by plotting the EDDB data as crosses and the HYG data as dots. The other interesting part is that some of the data points in the giant branch and white dwarf areas are identical, or very nearly so, which means my assumptions on converting the parameters isn't all that wrong. What is clear from this is that Frontier did look at scientific data in order to seed the Milky Way, at least around the bubble, and there's no reason to expect them not to have done the same for models around other locations. The missing drop at the M class is an obvious sacrifice they appear to have made away from realism, though what they did do to their credit is made a fairly good assumption that the number of density of low mass dwarfs is very high. This population is known to be missing from the database I used and speaks more about the sensitivity of the instruments used to see dim objects than reality. Hot stars are rare, cool stars are more common, so you do expect small stars to be everywhere. The other difference is the number of stars. Elite contains many more and is perhaps a gameplay mechanic to be sure we can navigate around effectively in our sidewinds. The only issue, if my analysis is correct, is that dwarf stars are too bright or too large in the game, though these things barely make more than a cosmetic impact. It would be nice to see how the Stellar Forge works on the inside, but unfortunately I was unable to get into the room at the Frontier Expo as it was full. If you have made it this far, firstly let me say thank you. If you're interested to hear more of my thoughts around the physics of Elite, then please subscribe and watch this space for more videos. I hope to touch upon different subjects such as planetary distributions, exotic stars, and some of the brain-melting physics that govern those. Till next time, fly safe, Commanders.